Share the screen. Okay. Uh, first thing I have to announce is we're going to end early today. I have to go to an appointment actually. So I'll be ending uh, maybe 45 or 50. And I know you're all disappointed about that, but that's the way it goes, right? Okay, so we're in a little early today. Uh, Time-wise, we're doing fine, I think. So we're here. We have uh, only four weeks left, or three and a half maybe, because next week is only a three-day week, so for Thanksgiving. Okay, and we just have, uh, what, six sections left? One, two, three, four, five, six. We have four weeks to do it. Okay. Um, I'm not sure about this last day of the test on Thursday. We'll see. This was originally meant to be, if we had met face to face, then, you know, if I give it to you on Thursday, I would give it back to you Friday. But now we don't have to worry about that since that's not really an issue. But so we'll see how it goes. For now, we'll keep this date as Thursday um, for the last regular test, Thursday the 10th. Okay. And reminder of the final exam. Our final exam is Wednesday the 16th, 11, 10 to 1 40. Please notice the time. We don't start at 12 o'clock, we start at 11 o'clock. Now, if you join at 12, you know, I guess that's sort of okay, but you're supposed to join at 11. I'll give out the exam at 11. I, I'm sort of taking attendance right at 11. I, I need to see your face, so to speak, by that time, so I don't think you're cheating on the final. <clears throat> uh, you can just use all the previous uh, formula sheets. So you don't have to remake them. Just hope, I hope you didn't throw them away. Uh, if you threw it away, then I guess just go back and make it again. But the most efficient way is if you still have the formula sheets from the first test, second test, third test, fourth test, and so on, right? Just keep them all, just use them all for the final exam, all right? And the final will be questions that are very similar to the old exams, okay? So now um, I usually give about 10 questions on a test, except this one obviously wasn't. So for the final, what would seem reasonable is maybe what, 15 or 20, I'm guessing, 15, 20 questions for the final. <clears throat> okay, and we're gonna have five tests. So how about if I give you, um, if I give you 15 questions, then maybe three from each test. And if I give you 20 questions, that'd be four from each test, something like that. Okay. Now they don't have to be the very same questions as the previous exams, but similar in style for how to study for the final exam, okay? <laughs> Okay, and uh, hopefully you caught everything over the weekend, but you should have gotten your score. Um, remember, you get to drop one exam. I know some of you missed this exam. You get to drop one exam, but dropping the exam could be part of the final exam also. Okay, so if the final turns out to be your worst score, you get to drop part of the final, but not all of the final. Okay, so that's how that works. Uh, again, there were eight questions, so eight times 10 is 80. Pretend there was a fake question nine and question 10, and you all got 10 points on it, provided that you took the test, a legitimate test, and submitted the homework. So in other words, if you didn't even take the test, no, you don't get those points. You still have a zero on the, on the test. Okay, so um, if you submitted a, leg a legitimate exam, then you got 10 points for question nine, 10 points for question 10. I didn't include that in the email, but if you added up the points, then just add 20 more, that's how you got your score on the last exam, okay? So that's the way that works. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna start 4.9. I'll lecture for a while until I think I've done enough. Then I have to get ready to go to my appointment, um, but we shall be okay time-wise, okay? So 4.9, I mentioned long before, that to me really belongs in chapter five, but here we go, okay. So 4.9, in fact, a lot of the chapter, five also, something called antiderivatives. As you might guess, it's sort of like going backwards from derivatives. Okay, so we were doing derivatives all semester, derivative, 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 and we're doing antiderivatives on page 350. Okay, so here's a definition. So do I have to write this down? I don't think so. I think I'd rather you just know the concept. If you know the concept, you don't have to write it down. A function f is called an antiderivative of little f, on an integral i if f prime of x is equal to little f of x or x and i. Okay, so we were going the derivative direction. The derivative of capital F is little f. 
So to, if we go the other direction, and antiderivative of little f is capital F. That's all. Okay, so we're just going backwards now. Derivative, antiderivative. Notice the language. It says an antiderivative, which seems to imply there's more than one, and that's correct. Okay. Now, when we have a function, we will say the derivative, meaning there's only one derivative. And that's true. If you have a function, there's only one derivative. However, there are many, actually an infinite class of antiderivatives, but um, they differ just by a constant, as I'll show you shortly. Okay, so what's going on here? So first I'm gonna introduce some notation, which the book does not go over in 4.9. It goes over back in chapter five. Okay, so new symbolism, this funny looking S, Okay, is, and then f of x dx. The way we're going to read this is the integral of f of x dx. Okay, so we don't know what it means yet, but this is called the integral sign or the integral symbol. Okay, and I believe uh, Mr. Stewart, if you look at the, the title of the book here, he's got his little violin here. Right? I think the whole idea behind the violin was this integral sign or integral symbol. Okay, so, you know, very funny, right? Anyway, okay, so how do you read this? The integral of f of x dx. Again, if you look at 4.9 in the text, you won't see it. He does introduce it in chapter five later. So I figured out why not just show it to you now. So if you look at the homework problems, you won't see that integral sign anywhere. Okay, so you don't see the integral sign anywhere for the homework. Likewise over here, he doesn't show you the integral sign, but I'm going to show it to you. So if you look at the directions, right? 4.9 page 355. Find the most general antiderivative of the function. Check your answer by differentiation. Okay, I'm going to use the integral sign or integral symbol, that funny looking S. Okay, he just says f of x, whatever, show the antiderivative. I will use the integral symbol. So the way we read this is the integral of f of x dx. <clears throat> okay, don't worry too much right now about the dx. Okay, it does name the variable though. So it tells you the variable is x. Sure, it kind of looks quote unquote obvious. Okay, but later on, we'll see it's not so obvious. But if you're integrating with a t, you're supposed to say dt. If you're integrating with an x, then you say dx. If you're integrating with a theta, you're supposed to say d theta. Okay, it becomes crucial a little bit later. Okay, so what does this funny integral sign mean? The meaning is give a class of antiderivatives of f of x. Okay, we don't even know what class means, but we will shortly. Let's give a whole bunch of antiderivatives of f of x. <clears throat> okay, uh, mathematical definition now. We will coin the word integration. Okay, now, of course, the word integration has lots of meanings in ordinary English, and of course, and that's a big deal nowadays. Okay, but the mathematical calculus idea of integration is anti-differentiation. Okay, so we've been doing differentiation for the majority of our course. Now we're doing anti-differentiation, but we don't want to keep saying anti-differentiation. That's too big a word, right? Uh, anti anti diff differentiation. I think that's eight syllables. Anti-differentiation. Eight syllables. And there's what? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Nineteen letters, right? How many English words do you know have 19 letters and eight syllables? So we don't feel like keep saying anti-differentiation. So we say integration. Okay. So in calculus and mathematics, when we say integration, we're talking about this anti-differentiation. Okay, so this is the integral sign, integral symbol. It means antiderivative, antidifferentiation. Okay, so integration for us. Okay, <clears throat> so we're not talking about the other many, you know, English definitions of integration. You know, they all have their purposes in place, of course, for, you know, the ordinary English word integration. But for integration in mathematics, it means antidifferentiation. Okay. All right, so let me show you how I'm going to write the problems. So in the text, page 355, just look at number one here. It just says f of x equals 4x plus 7. The directions say find the most general antiderivative of the function. Check your answer by differentiation. Okay, 
so Mr. Stewart says f of x equals 4x plus 7. I will write all of these problems with the integral sign. Make sure it's heavy. Integral of 4x plus 7 dx. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So this means give a class of antiderivatives. Okay. Now, the first few problems, I'm not even going to show you how to do it. Okay. But don't worry, I'll show you soon enough how to do it. Okay, I'm just going to show you the answer and why that makes sense as the answer. Okay, so I'll show you how to do it eventually. But the answer to this integral 4x plus 7 dx. Okay, we're not asking for the derivative. Okay, we know the derivative of this expression of this function is 4. We're not asking for the derivative. We're asking for, and I'm not, I can't even say the antiderivative or the integral. It's again a whole class of antiderivatives or integrals. So if you hear me say integral, say, what's this integral stuff? It's antiderivative, but we don't want to keep saying antiderivative, antidifferentiate, antidifferentiation. So integration or integral is what we're saying. Okay, here's the answer. <clears throat> 2x squared plus 7x plus c. Okay, just thought I mentioned to you right now. All of these problems for now should have the plus c. It properly belongs there. C is any constant. Okay, so c is any real number. It can be 0, 1, 2, 80 pi, negative pi, negative a million, uh, 316.5214148288. Okay, those are all included. Okay. All of these functions where C is any constant have the property, the derivative is this, right? What's the derivative of 2x squared? Or x. What's the derivative of 7x? 7. What's the derivative of whatever C you want? Zero. Okay, so notice it's not just one antiderivative, one integral. It's not just one function. It's a whole bunch of functions. So that's what we mean by a class of antiderivatives, but they all differ just by a constant. You can put any number that you want here, right? So C could be 5. That means 2x squared plus 7x plus 5 works. 2x squared plus 7x minus 5 works. 2x squared plus 7x plus nothing works. 2x squared plus 7x minus a million works. Any of those functions, plural, have the property, the derivative of any of those functions is 4x plus 7. Is that right? Okay. <clears throat> Number nine, square root of 2 dx. And by the way, you don't see any variable here. So this tells me the variable is x. Okay. The answer is radical 2x plus c. <clears throat> okay. Because the derivative of radical 2x plus any constant is radical 2. Okay, and notice if this said d theta, you'd have to put this as theta. So that'll become crucial later, right? If this says uh, dt, you'd have to put radical 2t plus c. Okay, so we have infinitely many solutions for an antiderivative. So for the derivative, if you're given a function, there's only one derivative, right? Up to now, for the whole semester, we've been saying the derivative. That's correct. We will say the integral or the antiderivative, but strictly speaking, that's not true. There's a whole bunch of antiderivatives. They differ by a constant, though. Okay, so this plus c, this includes radical 2x plus nothing, which is radical 2x, but it's also radical 2x plus 1, plus 2, minus 2, minus 80, minus a million, minus 323.4578. Okay, any real number that you want. Okay. All of those functions have the property that the derivative of any of those functions is this, because the derivative of radical 2x, radical 2, the derivative of any constant is 0, right? So that's what we now mean by a class of antiderivatives. So when I write integral f of x dx, give me a whole bunch of antiderivatives, but they all differ by a constant. Okay. All right, 17. Uh, we have to go backwards from our trig. Integral of 2 sine theta minus secant squared theta <clears throat> d theta. Okay, notice theta d theta. So you shouldn't have theta and x. Okay, x goes with x, theta with theta, t with t, or whatnot. <clears throat> okay, I've already shown you the answer, but I'll cover it for a second. Okay, so I want the integral antiderivative of 2 sine theta. What's the integral of 2 sine theta. Careful, not the derivative. I'm not asking for the derivative. I'm asking for antiderivative 
of two sine theta. That's negative two cosine theta. Is that right? And then minus secant squared. You have to think to yourself, okay, what function do I know has a derivative of secant squared? That's the tangent. And plus C. So negative two cosine theta minus tangent theta plus C is the proper answer. And how do you check your answer? Taking the derivative. <clears throat> The derivative of negative two cosine theta. Now, because the derivative of cosine is negative sine, the derivative of this would be positive two sine theta. Is that right? And derivative of negative tangent theta is negative secant squared theta, and derivative of any constant is zero. So we have it. Right? So we're just going backwards from our properties of derivatives, <clears throat> which now leads us to the power root. Okay, and I've got it here, but pretend you didn't know it just for a second. I'll cover it up, right? So we just go backwards from the power root of derivatives. What's the derivative of x to the n? x to the n, the derivative is n, x to the n minus 1. So what do we do? We multiply by the exponent and subtract it 1. So what will be the opposite? Add 1 and divide by the new exponent. Okay, so here's the power root. If you want to put that in your next cheat sheet, you may. The integral, not the derivative, we're going the other direction now. So you have to, you know, all of our, our minds have been programmed, so to speak, to do derivative. Now you got to go backwards. You got to go anti-derivative. Okay, so you add one to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. X to the n plus one divided by n plus one plus C. And of course, n cannot be negative one. <clears throat> you say, what do I do if n is negative one? I'll show you in just a second. Okay, so for instance, what's the integral of x dx? Well, that's like x to the one. So the rule is you bump up the exponent by one and divide by the new exponent. So x squared over two plus c. Double check, what's the derivative? Pretend this is one half x squared, right? So two comes out, not soft than one half, then you have x to the one, there it is. And the derivative of any constant is zero, so you know it works. Okay, so this is the power root. It works for any real number except for negative one. So what do I do if I have negative one? Integral of x to the negative one dx, you cannot do x to the zero over zero. We already know that, right? If I add one, you would go x to the zero over zero. Then you say, wait a minute, I can't divide by zero. Okay. Instead, when you have x to the negative one, recall that that means one over x. Okay, then you should say, oh yeah, integral of one over x, natural log, absolute value of x plus c. So now this is where I finally pick up the pieces from when I said a long time ago, maybe about a month ago. So a long time ago, <clears throat> I did the derivative of ln x. It was one over x. I did derivative of ln negative x. It was also one over x. Okay, that led us to the conclusion to say, that means the derivative of ln absolute value of x was of one over x. And then I said at that time, we're not gonna use it that much now, but we're gonna use that later. This is the later. Okay, so now is that, later I was talking about when we go backwards, okay? So you have to remember that when you integrate one over x dx, it's not just ln x, it's ln absolute value of x plus c, okay? All right, now, on page 352, Mr. Stewart, if I keep saying Mr. Stewart, who's Mr. Stewart? He's the author of the book that, you know, makes us, you know, and he has that integral sign. Yeah, there's that integral sign on that violin. He's the author of the book. Okay. There's a whole bunch of anti-derivative formulas, but when you stop and think about it, it's the same as the derivative formulas, just going backwards, right? The only really new one that you have to think about 
was the power root, right? X to the n plus one over n plus one. <clears throat> okay, so these you pretty much already knew. Notice it says particular antiderivative, because if you want all the antiderivatives, you'd have to put plus c for all of these. Plus c, plus c, plus c, plus c. But you know, he didn't feel like doing that. I don't feel like doing it, so we'll just leave it. Okay, so let's just look at these, but most of these are just going backwards from what we did with derivatives. Okay, what if we have a constant times a function? Well, the derivative was the constant times the derivative of the function. So likewise for the integral. Okay, so we have a number times a function. The integral is a number times the integral of the function. Integral of a sum, sum of the integral, because the derivative of a sum was the sum of the derivative. Likewise for a difference. Here's our power rule <clears throat> that I gave you. If you have x to the n, as long as n is not negative one, a particular antiderivative is x to the n plus one over n plus one. Okay, but remember, if you want to write all the antiderivatives, you have to go like this. N, x to the n plus one divided by n plus one plus c, plus any real number. That's why Mr. Stewart says particular antiderivative. And yeah, here's what I was talking about. Integral of one over x and then absolute value of x. So you have to put absolute value here. Now here's an easy one. I'm not showing it to you right now, but you can guess. What was the derivative of e to the x? e to the x. So what's the integral of e to the x? e to the x, right? Uh, this one, a little bit tricky. Do you recall the derivative, the derivative of b to the x? It was b to the x ln b. You multiply it by ln b. Therefore, what do you think happens when you integrate? Divide by ln b, exactly. Because the derivative and antiderivative are opposite operations, so to speak. Okay, or we'll say integral. So when you differentiate it, right, if you look back at your table of derivatives, when you have b to the x, right, you go b to the x ln b. So now when you antiderivative differentiate, you do the opposite, you divide by ln b. So b to the x divided by ln b. Okay. You can put this on your next cheat sheet. And this is part of what I just talked about. Okay, cosine, sine, not negative sine. So this kind of fouls your brain up a little bit. We're not asking for the derivative anymore. Yes, the derivative of cosine is sine, but that's not what we're asking. We're really saying what function is there whose derivative ends up being cosine? That's sine. Is that right? We're saying the derivative of sine x is cosine x. That's a particular antiderivative. Okay. Remember, you could say sine x plus one. The derivative of sine x plus one is also cosine x. The derivative of sine x minus pi over two is also cosine x. Okay, so that's why we have a whole class of antiderivatives, but they, differ, they just differ by constant. You can put any constant you want. Here. <clears throat> okay, are you guys okay with this? Sine x, negative cosine x. Again, we're not asking for the derivative. We're asking for the antiderivative. Okay, what function is there whose derivative is positive sine x? The derivative of negative cosine is positive sine, right? Because the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So you put a negative in front, right? Then you'd have negative, negative sine, which is sine. Okay, secant squared tangent, right? You should be okay with that. Folks, that's saying the exact same thing as the derivative of tangent is secant squared. Okay, in fact, that was problem number, uh, part of 17 that we did. Right, negative secant squared. So you're really saying, I'm not taking the derivative of secant squared. We're saying, what function is there whose derivative ends up being secant squared, or I guess negative secant squared, so negative tangent. Is that right? And let's see. Secant x, tangent x, secant x, right? Uh, inverse sine, inverse tangent, right? And cosh or sin sin are still very easy, right? Since they are derivatives of each other, the integral of cosh is cinch and the integral of cinch is cosh. Is that right? 
Okay, that's the way it works. Okay, so I'll do a few more and then I'm going to call it a day already. Okay, so back to the, okay, so remember the way the textbook has it, Mr. Stewart just has, you know, the functions, but I'm going to write them as integral. I'll say integral, blah, 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 blah. In 15, integral of 1 plus t plus t squared over radical t dt. <clears throat> Just to let you know, there's actually no such thing as a product rule for integrals. There's no such thing as a quotient rule for integrals. So that's why they tend to be a lot tougher. <clears throat> okay. Let's suppose I have a function like x sine of x. Don't write it down. x sine x, say product rule. I know what to do. First times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. Okay, no such thing in calculus. Okay, which means um, they're definitely a lot harder. So, in fact, one of the major topics in Calc two for those of you going on to Calc two, hopefully next semester, you'll have products and quotients. Okay, like x cosine x. You feel like saying, "Oh, why don't I just do the product group?" There is no product group. Okay, or if you have something divided by something, why don't I just do the quotient group? It's because there is no quotient group. So a major portion of Calc 2 is how do I integrate when I have products and quotients? You feel like saying, let me just do the product group, let me just do the quotient group, but there isn't any. You have to come up with other tricks. Okay, so this is a quotient. How should I do this? Just divide them out. Do one divided by that, t divided by that, t divided by that, and you end up with this. Okay, so one divided by radical t, t to negative half t to the one over t to the half, t to the half. t squared over t to the half, t to the three halves. Okay, so now I'm ready to integrate. For each of these, I'll do the power root. What's the power root for integrals? Okay, so we're not differentiating now. We know for derivatives, right? We go n, x, n minus one. <clears throat> Multiply, subtract one. What's the opposite? Add one and divide. Okay, so I add one to the exponent and divide by that new exponent. So t to the negative a half. t to the positive a half divided by one half. t to the one half becomes t to the three halves. Add one, right? t to the three halves divided by three halves. t to the three halves becomes t to the five halves divided by five halves, okay? Now, you know, these don't look very nice, okay? So from arithmetic, anytime you divide by a fraction, you multiply by the reciprocal, right? So dividing by one half means multiplying by two. Dividing by three halves, multiply by two thirds. Dividing by five halves, multiply by two fifths, okay? And yeah, for this one, since it's t to the half, the normal way to write t to the half is a square root. Okay. But these two, you don't have to write them in radical form if you don't want to. Just leave it at c to the three halves, c to the five halves. <clears throat> and yes, don't forget the plus c. The plus c properly does belong there. Okay. So there's my result. <clears throat> okay. And by the way, um, this is not that big of a jump. Um, you're all very good in arithmetic because you're taking calculus. Uh, you wouldn't be taking calculus without knowing arithmetic. So uh, for most of the rest of the time, I think I'm just going to do this rather than dividing by a fraction, I'll just quickly multiply by the uh, reciprocal, okay? So I may just go straight from, let's say, here to here. I'll say t to the one half. I'll say, okay, t to the three halves, there it is, divided by three halves means times two thirds. Okay, that's not too big of a jump for you guys, right? So in arithmetic, when you divide by a fraction, multiply by the reciprocal. So I may just jump straight to multiplying by the reciprocal, if you don't mind, okay. Okay, try something like uh, 19, 2 to the x plus 4 cinch x. Okay, and cover it up again. I already showed it, but anyway. Okay, what's the derivative of 2 to the x? Derivative. 2 to the x ln 2, which means 2 to the x times ln 2. Therefore, when you anti-differentiate, integrate, I don't multiply by ln two, I'm doing the opposite. 
divided by ln2. And the integral of four cinch x for cosh x plus c. Okay, so again, all of these should have a plus c unless you can find a c. Okay, so I'll show you one problem that involves finding a c and maybe I'll stop with that. So sorry, if you have a question for me, I won't be able to take it too much. I'll check the chat. Maybe somebody said, said something in the chat, but uh, because I have to go to an appointment, I can't stay that long. Sorry about that. <clears throat> but let's see, for something like uh, 20, we, it now says, okay, again, skip any calculator icon like that. Find the antiderivative that satisfies the given condition. Check your answer, blah, 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 blah. Okay, they're gonna give you some other condition like f of zero equals four or whatever. And you'll see that in some of these other problems here, f of one equals five. What that means is that you'll be able to find out the value of C, okay? So you do the first part as regular, but then use this information to find the value of C. So your answer isn't gonna be blah, blah, blah plus C, it'll be plus a particular value of C. <clears throat> So let me show you what I'm talking about. So in general right now, in general, your answer should be blah, 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 plus C, blah, 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 plus C, blah, 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 plus C. You need to put the plus C. If you don't put the plus C, it's technically wrong. I can take off points for it. Okay. <clears throat> so it does belong there. Now, 23, you'll be able to find the C. So here's how you find the C. Okay, so they showed you this. Okay, so if they just showed me that, I would integrate. But now this enables me to find the C. Okay, so this part, I do the normal integration. Okay, so if you have a number in front, just put the number five, x to the fifth over five, minus two, x to the sixth over six, plus c. Five cancels out, x to the fifth, minus one third, x to the sixth, plus c. That's capital F of x. Okay. Double check. What's the derivative of any of these functions? <clears throat> okay, why am I saying functions? You can have any C that you want. You have infinitely many functions, but they all have to start with that and that, then just pick any real number. What's the derivative of that? Five X to the fourth. What's the derivative of that? Six times negative one third is negative two X to the fifth. And what's the derivative of any constant? Zero. So it definitely works. Now I can find the actual value of C by plugging in F of zero equals four. <clears throat> so this is my X. This is my y. You say, y, where's y? I don't see any y. Well, remember, capital F of x is like y, right? So four is the answer after I plug in zero here and zero here. And zero here makes that zero, zero here makes that zero. So four y is equal to x is zero. Put a zero there, zero there, nothing, nothing. So c is four. Okay, so my final answer this time isn't plus c. I was able to find c. Okay, here's examples where you have to find the C. If they say something like F of zero equals four, that enables you to find the C value. So my final answer isn't blah, blah, blah plus C. My final answer is this, X to the fifth minus one third X to the sixth plus four, which isn't infinitely many solutions. It's only one solution with two properties. <clears throat> the two properties are the derivative is this. And you can double check that, right? What's the derivative of this? Five X to the fourth minus two x to the fifth plus nothing. Okay. Property number two, when you plug in zero, you get four. Zero, zero, four, it definitely works. Okay, so only when they give you that extra information will your final answer not be plus c, you can figure out the c by plugging in and you have, you know, in this particular case, the answer of four. Okay. All right, folks, and that's pretty much about it for today. Uh, let me just check the chat real quickly. Uh, the chain rule still apply for antiderivatives. It depends, okay? It works for constants, um, but not for variables, unfortunately. In fact, we'll see some examples right at the end of our course for that. Am I teaching 252 next semester? I'm not scheduled to right now, okay? <clears throat> Ironically, I'm teaching Calc 2 this semester at City College. I'm teaching Calc 3 at City College next semester, but right now I'm not scheduled to teach 252 um, in case anybody was wondering about that. I say I'm not scheduled to right now. Sometimes things happen at the last minute and then something might change, but anyway, um, that's the way it goes right now. 
Okay, I think that's pretty much about it. So that'll be all for today, folks. So everybody have a good afternoon and we'll see you all tomorrow. Okay, all right, bye everybody. Have a good day.